Section 11 of Oscar Wilde, Art and Morality, A Defence of the Picture of Dorian Gray, edited by Stuart Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. Section 11. If a man's work is easy to understand, an explanation is unnecessary and if his work is incomprehensible, an explanation is wicked. Profuse and perfervid. The review in The Speaker, which Oscar Wilde referred to in his letter to the Scots Observer, was as follows. By a stroke of good fortune, singular at this season, the two stories which we have taken up to review this week turn out to be, each in its way, of no slight interest. Footnote. The second story was Perfervid, The Career of Ninian Jameson, by John Davidson, Ward and Downey. Of Mr. Wilde's work this was to be expected. Let it be granted, to begin with, that the conception of the story is exceedingly strong. A young man of remarkable beauty, perfect in body, but undeveloped, or rather lacking altogether, in soul, becomes the dear friend of a painter of genius. The artist, under the spell of this friendship, is painting the youth's portrait enter to them the spirit of evil in the shape of lord henry wotton an extremely fin de siècle gentleman who by a few inspiring words supplies or calls into life the boy's missing soul and it is an evil one henceforward the tale develops the growth of this evil soul side by side with this mystery that while vice and debauchery write no wrinkle on the boy's face but pass from it as a breath off a pain every vile action scores its mark upon the portrait which keeps accurate record of a loathsome life it has been insinuated that this story should be suppressed in the interest of morality. Mr. Wilde has answered that art and ethics have nothing to do with each other. His boldness in resting his defence on the general proposition is the more exemplary, as he might fairly have insisted on the particular proposition that the teaching of the book is conspicuously right in morality. If we have correctly interpreted the book's motive, and we are at a loss to conceive what other can be devised, this position is unassailable. There is perhaps a passage or so in the description of Dorian's decline that were better omitted, but this is a matter of taste. The motive of the tale, then, is strong. It is in his treatment of it that Mr. Wilde has failed, and his mistakes are easy of detection. Whether they can be as readily corrected is doubtful. To begin with, the author has a style as striking as his matter, but he has entirely missed reconciling the two. There is an amateurish lack of precision in the descriptive passages. They are laboured, finikin, overlaid with paint, and therefore they want vigour. The picture of Dorian Gray has been compared, very naturally, with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and we would invite Mr. Wilde to take up that story and consider the bold, sharply defined strokes with which its atmosphere and milieu are put in. Such brevity as Mr. Stevenson's comes from sureness of knowledge, not want of care, 
and is the first sign of mastery nor is mr wilde too wordy alone he is too paradoxical only the cook who has yet to learn will run riot in truffles we will admit at once that lord henry's epigrams are admirable examples taken separately but a story demands simplicity and proportion and here we have neither it demands restraint and here we find profusion only it demands point and here the point is too often obscured by mere cleverness lord henry's mission in the book is to lead dorian gray to destruction and he does so if you please at the end of a string of epigrams in fact we should doubt that mr wilde possessed the true storyteller's temperament were it not for some half a dozen passages here is one where dorian tells of his engagement to sibyl vane the actress lips he says that shakespeare taught to speak have whispered their secret in my ear i have had the arms of rosalind around me and kissed juliet on the mouth yes dorian i suppose you were right said hallward slowly have you seen her to-day said lord henry dorian gray shook his head i left her in the forest of arden i shall find her in an orchard in verona lord henry sipped his champagne in a meditative manner at what particular point did you mention the word marriage dorian and what did she say in answer perhaps you forgot all about it my dear harry i did not treat it as a business transaction and i did not make any formal proposal i told her that i loved her and she said she was not worthy to be my wife not worthy why the whole world is nothing to me compared to her women are wonderfully practical murmured lord henry much more practical than we are the last chapter of the tale is good story-telling throughout in style and matter as good as chapter nine is bad footnote chapter nine in the lippincott version is chapter eleven in later editions the last chapter thirteen being afterwards divided into two nineteen and twenty and when mr wilde thoroughly sees why two particular sentences in that last chapter the park is quite lovely now i don't think there have been such lilacs since the year i met you though trivial in themselves are full of significance and beauty in their setting he will be far on the road to eminence in fiction he has given us a work of serious art strong and fascinating in spite of its blemishes will he insist on being taken seriously and go on to give us a better end of section 11